goodness, something is being weird. Okay, my computer just talked to me, but um, they're trying to fundraise and get resources for the indigenous cultures, um, such as the Sioux, which are in the Black Hills, um, North Dakota. So it's really broadening what we've learned in middle school and trying to make it more interactive with the community. So if anyone does have resources, books, clothing, anything like that that they want to donate, um, bring it to the library for them. Um, another th quick thing is, um, as a senior, I like to talk about what's going on in my life. And um, not personally for me yet, but a lot of students are uh, applying early action and they're getting accepted early action. Um, I'm personally applying in January though. Um, so this past few weeks, uh, the conversation, which is a club at U32, held presentations where they educated and raised awareness to all the grades, seven through 12, about rape culture, sexual assault and harassment in general, and how it affects our school community. Um, I think everyone at school went to the meetings and it was really important for everyone to hear and just to start the conversation. Um, another thing with um, our school newspaper and article I just published recently is about um, a junior who created, is creating this album um, in music and it's becoming a public thing. And I feel like that's a really big deal um, to represent and showcase our students as they do um, proceed in success and progress and all of that. And along the lines of sports, my last note tonight is that um, Paige Oaks and Riley Richards um, in golf also got um, within the top five for their championship in Vermont. So sports are looking really good and it will probably be talked about later, but winter sports are hopefully going to happen uh, very soon after Thanksgiving. Thank you. Any board questions? Thank you very much, both of you. Any board questions? I don't see any. Thank you for a comprehensive report and good luck in college admission. <laughs> Thanks for being here with us tonight. Um, oh, Maggie has their hand up. Don't go away, Anna and Maya. Maggie, go ahead. I was just curious um, what the general perspective and conversation is around having all of next week off, which is different than prior years. So what's, what's the vibe? Um, I mean, students seem pretty happy about it, I'm going to be honest. Um, some teachers, they're like throwing everything into this week with like summatives and finishing up units, which like they're not used to because we haven't had a full week off in a very long time. But the general consensus is that I think everyone likes it. Yeah, I, I think I would second that. I haven't heard a whole lot about it. Um, I'm personally very excited. I just moved um, into a house in Berlin. Um, my dad just bought a house. So this full week is a really good um, relax and unpack week for me. And for other students, we get to relax and sleep in for once. So it's exciting. Yeah, I would just say from administration and teachers, uh, we're not against it. <laughs> Being off Deserve it. You yeah. need it. Thank you. OK. Superintendent report. So okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID. I'll give you some updates and um, invite Maria into the conversation in just a minute. As of today, we have had 58 cases in our schools. That's a lot. And we are feeling the stress of that. We have implemented test to stay. And just to be clear, test to stay is a program that allows unvaccinated asymptomatic students to take a test if there has been an in-school exposure. They get a negative test, they are allowed to stay for the day and, um, and participate in school activities. They should be quarantining otherwise. Uh, we got even more people trained for test to stay in the past week. So um, principals, a few central office folks were helping out when necessary. And I think that we learned as we implemented it, quite frankly, the hard way that we were so focused on the logistics of making it happen. And I will say I personally was so excited to have an option to keep kids in school that we hadn't really thought about the emotional impact and the fact that 
um, that it's just a completely different practice and that that is also causing stress, right? When we have sent kids away as, as close contacts, but now that we're inviting them to test to stay in, um, that that's just a little bit different and there's a little bit more risk involved in that. And so um, after learning the hard way at Berlin um, and, and huge gratitude to the Berlin uh, school community for engaging in that dialogue with us, we've been more proactive since then to talk to folks um, in schools before or just as that's happening. Um, we have achieved the 82% vaccination rate at U32, which means protocols change at U32 since we're above 80. And I would invite Maria just to quickly share with you a little bit about what that means before I share a few other things. So Maria. Hi everyone. Um, so the Agency of Education uh, has asked us um, that once our um, student population at U32 um, at any of our schools goes above 80%, that we do change some of our practices. Um, what we have stopped doing is actually quarantining um, anyone except positive cases. So if there is a positive case at school, we, of course, um, ask that student to leave if they have come into school. And then the remainder of the contacts of that student, we just notify. We ask them to um, monitor themselves for, uh, I mean, we talk to their parents. We ask them to monitor themselves for symptoms um, if they need to to get tested. But vaccinated people um, in a school with a vaccination rate of 80% or above are not required to test. Um, unvaccinated people are strongly recommended to test um, at three to five days. So there are some different um, regulations and requirements now out for U32 than we have for the rest of uh, our schools. Thanks, Maria. Um, I will share a little bit more and then Maggie, we're happy to answer any questions that you have. So Maya and Anna talked a little bit about winter sports. Um, I've been working with the Winooski Valley superintendents to come up with some regional agreements. And we've agreed among those, with, within those agreements that home team rules will prevail. And so um, with our rate right now and our case count, uh, we're trying to figure out what exactly that's gonna mean in terms of spectators and no spectators masking, who's uh, overseeing and ensuring that spectators do wear masks. So we've had some conversation and we will continue that. We couldn't pull the team of us together to do that this week. We're gonna do it Monday and hope to provide some more guidance with you about that and some clear communication. Um, likewise, we're continuing to explore all the nuances around um, particularly elementary basketball. Um, so please stay tuned for that um, information. I wanna share with you that we, um, as we were upset that we couldn't offer vaccine clinics from um, until after January or the beginning of January. And we've heard from the Department of Health that they're trying hard to figure something out with us. Recently, just yesterday, we heard that there were vacancies at Spalding's clinic that's happening tomorrow. Maria sent that um, information out to families. It was too quick for us to pull together any kind of um, bus trip down to Spalding, but we did let families know we're working with um, Osco Pharmacy in the hope that they can help us coordinate something sooner than the beginning of January. Um, I will share with you as well that throughout the fall, the Labor Management Committee has been working together to come up with a memorandum of understanding um, between the association and, um, and the admin and the parties. And we are, um, we tended to, we verbally agreed to something that I'm gonna bring to you in December. I wanna say that it's taken longer than we had hoped for, quite frankly, because we've been so busy dealing with COVID and other issues as you're aware. And because my learning curve as your interim superintendent has been steep, um, just about how, what the process is. So um, what we totally agree to is that the safety and health of our students and our staff is at the forefront of our practice. Practices. Again, we have some verbal agreement. The association is going to take it to their membership, um, ideally right after the Thanksgiving break, um, ideally for a, you know, a ratification, and we'll bring it to you all as well. 
A um, couple key highlights, still providing protective equipment as we have been. We wanted to, you all had extended the leave time through September and we would like to continue to offer our employees um, an administrative um, paid leave for quarantining purposes that is separate from their sick time. We want our sick employees to stay home and we wanna keep everybody safe and we don't want them fretting about uh, using up all of their sick days. We also want them want to encourage vaccination and getting boosters. And so that would apply to that as well. Um, we want our employees to um, provide proof of vaccination. And so we're going to send a message out to, that, to them tomorrow, asking them to provide proof and letting them know that um, absent that proof, they will be um, treated as unvaccinated individuals um, and will want them to be engaging in regular surveillance testing. And the other thing I guess I would highlight for you is that we're agreeing that this is retroactive from October 1st. Again, we've been, we've been working on it for a long time. It's been um, a, a very, uh, I'd say healthy and collaborative process. It's just taken longer than we would have hoped. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is just, again, you have all alluded to it as well. There is stress in our school system. There's a lot going on. And um, I will say I've been so grateful for uh, the support that we have received, um, the offers to help. And I personally am really grateful for the upcoming week uh, of break as well. Um, hoping that everybody takes some time to just breathe and um, ref reflect and relax and renew in preparation for that next push when we come back on the 29th. Any questions for Jen? I see Maggie, Maggie, Jonas and Diane. So go ahead, Maggie. I have three questions. First, um, students who've been exposed or direct contacts, are they, are they eligible? Do they have access to testing in school beyond the Monday PCR testing? And if so, has this been communicated to families and students? And the second question is, are children eligible to utilize the vaccine clinic at Berlin Mall? And if so, has this been communicated to district families? And thirdly, if spectators cannot attend are administration and sports leaders in the district exploring use of CVT Sportsnet or another way that these um, games can be broadcast via the internet? Thank you. So I can take the first two or the second two questions, and Maria, if you can talk more about testing protocols. So um, we have been advertising about vaccination clinics. Maria had sent information about that as soon as the vaccine was um, available for kids ages 5 to 11. And um, we did enjoy live streaming last year services, and that went well. So while we have, I have not actively had a conversation with anybody about that yet, because we have yet to make a decision about it. I would think that that would be a viable option that we would explore. Um, Maria, testing questions. Sure, so um, right now at our disposal within the district, we have three different testing methodologies. We have our surveillance testing, which anybody regardless of vaccination status is encouraged to take advantage of. That occurs every Monday. We have something called uh, test to stay, which is only, um, offered to unvaccinated students who are exposed in the school. So the other thing is test to stay is not recommended for schools above the 80% vaccination threshold. Um, it's seen as a pull of resources during a time when we don't have as many resources as we would like. So unfortunately, we do not offer test to stay or any of the rapid tests um, for people that are at U32, with the exception of our third testing methodology, methodology, which is response testing. So at any of our schools now, if a student or a staff member comes in with symptoms, I don't feel well, I have a headache, oh, I have a fever, um, et cetera, my throat hurts, we will rapid test them with the permission of the parents, of course. We would rapid test them in the office. If it is positive, it's considered to be a positive test result. They don't test again, they go home, they quarantine for 10 days, we start again. Um, if the rapid is negative, we do take a PCR swab and we send it off to Binks Healthcare, which is who does our surveillance testing. 
So while we can offer rapids and PCRs to symptomatic students and staff, we cannot offer test to stay to the U32 community. We do offer it at all of the elementary schools when there has been um, an exposure in school. Any exposure in the community or in the home is not eligible for any of our testing um, to stay programs. They're required to quarantine per the state guidance because their risk of transmission is that much higher than in school. And I do feel that the elementary schools are very aware of their options for their kids. So they're going to get there in the same way she's going through. Thank you, Maria. Jonas? Yeah, just, I just wanted to address uh, uh, Jen's comments about the impending MOU, uh, the COVID MOU. Um, Jen, I'm sorry I haven't been able to attend the last couple of sessions as fully as I wanted because I was dealing with my own family's COVID issues. We had a false positive, thank goodness. Um, and I just want to say that the, the sessions, the LMC sessions that I have been able to uh, attend have been cordial and productive, um, and I get the sense that the administration and uh, the unions are um, operating from the same set of values. Um, and I think, you know, from the draft that I saw, that's reflected in in that document, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. So thank you to Jen, and thanks to everybody on the other side of the table who's been engaging in good faith um, and in in a productive way during a really really stressful time. So thanks to everybody who's working on that. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Diane? So this one's kind of out of left field, so I apologize, Jen, because it wasn't on the agenda, but I do feel that um, as part of the steering committee for the agenda that we need to start putting this on there is the concern that has been raised now twice about the, the lack of a certified music teacher at Berlin and the process around it. And it's, and it's, that obviously is uppermost in my mind, but also makes me realize as a board member, if there are other vacancies or shortages across our district, uh, apprising us of what's occurring, what are the plans and how are we addressing those shortages. But it is, um, I, as a board member, I need some more concrete information as to what's happening and how those decisions are, are being made. So I have a good idea about instruction. Hey, Diane, I wonder if um, when you do the action right around personnel, if we, we could easily embed a report around um, current vacancies and progress we're making, that we could do that right then. Great idea. Yep. Yeah. Lindy? Yeah, I just wanted to um, follow up on Jen's report and her honesty and positive outlook in a very hard situation. I have really appreciated this year. And I know it's been a huge learning curve and curriculum is her love. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate how we're hearing that the team is stepping up and the team is working to make this work across our schools. Cause I know we have a very strong leadership team and I'm grateful for their help in the work that has to go on to run our schools and to help in Jen's interim position. Um, so I, I hear you and I appreciate the positive tone in a very difficult time that could be very negative. Um, and I appreciate the teamwork and collaboration to keep our schools as safe and as, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know, positive or stress-free as you can. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, Maggie? You're muted. Two questions, one for Maria. Um, some other school districts not in Vermont, school testing. I looked on the website, I can't tell whether these PCR tests are being pulled or whether these are individual tests. So that's my question for you. And just following up on what Diane was um, uh, saying about the openings, I'm looking for clarity on whether there is is or isn't also a music vacancy at Callis? And if so, you know, 
I, I would also like some clarity on what the plan is, if, you know, as a unified district with teachers being employees of the district now, what is the, 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 the limitation on getting these educators into the classrooms, into the schools that need them so these kids can have the equity they deserve? Um, Maggie, I'm going to ask you to repeat your question. I didn't understand it. Pool testing rather than individual PCR testing. Um, I have friends who are educators in other parts of the country, and they mm -hmm. are pool testing. And then only if from that very large sample, there is a, a, a positive yielded from combining all of that testing are they using the individual tests to then identify the individuals? I have never heard of that. Um, it's not okay. something that our state uh, engages in or has offered for our schools. I'm happy to look into it. Do you know what the, okay, okay. <laughs> no, I think it's, it's, I think it's causing a great deal of stress in school uh, districts in other parts of the country because okay by capturing that many samples together rather than individually. I think it's mm -hmm. a cost-saving measure, but I looked at the website. I couldn't identify whether Binks was using this technique, um, but I wanted to raise the question because it came up. Okay. With I will certainly clarify, but not to my knowledge. Are we using anything called pool testing, right? Everything is individualized um, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, thank you, Maggie. Uh, Jen, do you have anything else? No, okay. So let's let's move on. We're done with our uh, reports and let's move on into finance. I'm gonna take uh, just a quick look around. Does anybody need a break or can we push through the rest of the agenda? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, uh, welcome to CN. Thank you for let's get started. Uh, we, we sent you some informational stuff. Uh, we have divided it to try to make it quicker for, for us. I wonder if you have any, any questions on the monthly reflection or the quarterly fund balance uh, for Suzanne or the finance committee. I'm not seeing any heads moving. And I, I guess just for the record on, on the ORCA, I just wanna say that one, one thing to, to have for people to know is that the fund balance update was completed, which resulted in an additional amount of 171,623 additional fund balance. And that's primarily due to between the budgeted and the new higher benefit selection. So just so that people that are watching the meeting had the benefit to that. And let's move into the capital uh, improvement. Uh, Chris O'Brien is on vacation, so he won't be joining us uh, today, but I'm gonna look at Kari or, or, or Scott to make a motion, and then we'll, we'll have some discussion. Do you guys mind? It's on page 95, Kari, go ahead. Scott, I'll take this first one, you can go next. So um, I'll recommend that the board authorize the superintendent to complete bidding for the projects listed on the WC UUSD capital improvement project plan FY2223 budget column for a total estimated cost of $1,533,863. Second. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Scott. Any discussion from board members? Seeing that, seeing that we don't have any questions, we just want to share that the importance of doing this now is to this would allow them to move as quickly as possible to make sure that we get uh, the bids and we get the people working because, as you know, there's a shortage of labor in the state. So, uh, having said that, everybody, uh, all those in favor of the motion as read by Kari, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Energy project consultant, uh, Kari, if you don't mind, Scott is gonna take policy because Chris McVeigh is not gonna be able to join us today. So if you don't mind, keep going with that or you guys can tag along sure. however you guys wanna do it. Yeah. Yep. So the, there's two here. The first one is um, 
I move that the board authorize superintendent to sign a contract and just forward a forward thinking consultants LLC at a rate of $100 an hour, not to exceed $2,000 for identifying the right net metering partners for the school district. Carry moves. Could I have a second? Second. Thanks, Scott. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. It, can you do the second one, Kari, on that? Sure, the second part is that I'll move that the board authorize the superintendent to sign a one month extension to the current net metering agreement with Kingsbury Hydroelectric. And Scott, you're muted, but I assume you said second. You, you assume correctly. Thank you for that. Okay, all right. Any discussion? Floor, I couldn't hear the month. It broke up on me what Kari oh, yeah. So, said. Yeah, so it's for extending it for one month. And that would allow us to do some uh, some work with the consultant that we are hiring. In the meantime, just so that the board knows, we're still trying to negotiate with Robbie Porter to extend that further than than one month. That that would allow us to better uh, see our options. But so far, uh, Robbie has ag agreed to one month, and that will carry us for for the time being. But we will be if something changes, we'll be back to you next month. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion as read by Kari, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. Now the really exciting out of floor scrubber then I believe Chris McVeigh wanted to write on. Uh, please, could I <laughs> motion? Sorry, we have to keep it funny a little bit it's a long meeting uh, Kari Scott oh, <laughs> Kari. okay sure sure I'll move that the board authorize the superintendent to sign a 36 month lease agreement with Hilliard and all lines leasing company for $971.22 per month for two trident right on auto scrubbers and one trident walk behind auto scrubber with the option to purchase the equipment for $1 at the end of the lease. Thank you, Carrie. Second. Second. Thanks, Scott. Any questions? Any discussion? Hearing none. Anybody else wants to write it? No. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Transportation bid. Yeah, you want to go? Sure, I, I'll warm up my vocal cords. Thank you. Um, I move that the board award the bid to first student, transportation bid to first student based on the bus bid. Can I start over? <laughs> I move <laughs> the board award the bid to first student based on the bus bid with direction for selecting electric, uh, no, you should have done it. <laughs> the, I move that the board award the bid for to first student based on the bus bid with direction for selecting diesel buses. Second. Thank you both. Uh, any discussion? I see Maggie's hand up already. I can almost anticipate. Go ahead, Maggie. You can almost anticipate, huh? I just no, wanted no, I, to, uh, I wanted to just acknowledge our first student drivers, in mm -hmm. addition to our, you know, our on-site faculty and administration, because they are absolutely also um, under a great deal of stress and um, working under uncomfortable conditions with the windows open, as are the students. Um, so much appreciation to first student employees. Thank you, Maggie. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking before that. Uh, Lindy? I just had a question about the, the board action in our packet versus what Scott said, because it says or like selecting diesel or electric buses, 
but that was left off, so I was curious. Yeah, we, we needed to pick one or the other. If you looked at the information, it has two different options, Lindy. So the motion was done. So the, what the uh, finance committee does is just a recommendation. So the, we needed to do the motion, pick one. And that's what, what Scott said is what the, the, the finance committee recommended. Because I misread the information because I thought it was saying the bus might the bus company might have both or something is why I misread yeah, it. Yeah, so that's that's one of the options. But if you see that, it's just super expensive. So 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 it's not like we don't want it. We would you know, and anyways, they could provide a full fleet of electric buses. I can let Suzanne. Do you want to speak to to that? Sure. Uh, first, students submitted one uh, option that was all diesel buses, which is the first table in the write-up. And then the second uh, option was including three electric buses in year three. And the reason that they only uh, offered up three and they did it in year three was a uh, shortage of equipment. So that's why it had to be delayed. And then they identified uh, the geography and the topography as being too difficult in many of our routes because of the um, upward bound uh, trajectory. <laughs> and um, also the length of the routes was a problem. So they identified that, or they recommended only using uh, three electric buses in our routes. And so that's what you're seeing in the second table is a mix of diesel and electric. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, one more, uh, Michaelin. Sorry, I, I'm now confused though. So are we opting out of the electric? For, for now, yes. For now we're opting out of the electric without, you know, not saying that we don't wanna do it. It's just, if you look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. So for financial reasons, we're opting out for yeah for financial reasons and it would just be three buses so it doesn't mean that we don't want to get there so it's in our you know that's where we want to be but there's not in and because of the like Suzanne explained because of the uh, the landscape we you know we can't really with the technology available for us right now it wouldn't be the best decision well, not that we don't want to do that yeah I would oppose um not going with electric when we can for the record yeah, yeah, and we 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 gave Diane just to be clear, we gave the uh, Suzanne some, you know, sort of the, that if there was availability of ESSER funds or any grants that we could use, that she would look into it. But so far, that didn't seem to be an option. Uh, let me just see my uh, Ursula and then Jonas. How many buses are in our complete fleet? Like that we utilize. Um, the bed Michelle. Response. Bed was for 25 buses, and that includes our reserve buses. Thank you. Thanks, Ursula. Jonas? You're muted. I'm to, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what the, the, the delta between the two offers is a something about $450,000, if, yeah. if I'm right. Over the three years. Yeah, I'd say it was about mm -hmm. that. Or over the over the five years, right? Or the, those those three years, yeah. Which represents, yeah. you know, you know, about you know, a little less than a hundred thousand dollars a year over those five years, and also represents that an eight million dollar bid. That's about a five and a half percent delta between the all diesel and the partial electric option. You know, I I'm I'm with McCallum that I would love to be able to to use electric buses. Um, and I'm just not sure if that, you know, if my numbers are, are wrong, you know, throw them back at me. Um, but about that five and a half percent over the five years is, I, I, I'm not certain if that's worth it to go partially electric. Lindy? I know they're testing the next few actually weeks or months they're going to be testing to see how well they're doing and we do have some pretty rough routes so perhaps we'll get more information after some of that testing in vermont to see how it works and things will change and for student knows that's where we're going we would like so um 
I, I understand this now better. And uh, I think they'll hear that if the testing goes well, but um, I still remember my father-in-law when he was a superintendent talking about when they went to the snub nose that worked great down in the South, but they couldn't get up the hills and up here in Vermont. And so this testing that they're doing in Barrie and I think St. Albans, um, they may not have the altitude changes we have, but we'll, we need to watch that and just see where it goes. Thank you, Lindy. Uh, Jonas, do you have an extra question? Or that was an old hand? Okay. Are we ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion as read, uh, by Scott, <laughs> please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. No. Okay, so I'm, I missed. So, McKaylin and Jonah, they have two no votes. All right. All right. So, the motion carries. We'll move with this old process. Just because we had a couple of no's, so I just want to make that clear. All right. Yeah. Now, 6.25, the copier bid, which is a mouthful too. Yeah. Scott, are you ready or should I give it to Kari? <laughs> I, I have been rehearsing my dramatic reading, but maybe we should give it to Kari. It's up to you. I, <laughs> okay. Wanna, let's move the meeting along. <laughs> All right. Um, I move that the board award the copier and printer bid to SimQuest with Konica Minolta copiers and printers and approve and authorize the superintendent to sign the proposed tax exempt lease with MST Government Leasing LLC for the purposes of leasing, refinancing, and funding photocopy equipment leases, including consultant fees and related costs of issuances of such leases in an amount not to exceed $183,517.21 and an annual interest rate of 3.290% through August 1st, 2025. Thank you, Scott. A second. Thanks, Kari. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the motion as read by Scott, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. And then we're going to move into the general fund draft number one. And I'm going to pass this on to Suzanne and Jen for a quick. So I'll do a super quick introduction and then pass it on to Suzanne for the details. And we talked about this earlier tonight around um, the budget, really wanting to make sure that it's a reflection of um, meeting our students' needs and our community's values. So you can see the um, principles that have guided the service, the level of service budget in this particular draft. Um, and we'll talk through a little bit more about the process and the timeline, but I would invite Suzanne to really take the lead here. Um, this is the work, her work and the fiscal team work and the you know, leadership team so far. So Suzanne. Thank you. Uh, the first section I've described in the, the memo is about the level service budget and what it does include. Uh, we've included the current staffing salaries plus estimates for inflation, uh, health insurance increases at 5.2%, which is from VHI, the dental and HRA uh, amounts that were previously brought to the board for their approval. Uh, we utilized a 0.25% increase for the VMERS contribution. After publishing, we've been notified that it's actually going to increase to 0.5, so that number will have to change in the next iteration. Uh, early retirement projected cal calculations are included as well as the fund balance allocation that had previously been identified for use by the board. Uh, current special ed student needs for our out-of-district placements, transportation, and other services. Um, the transportation 
uh, for special ed does not include any increase that was quoted in this transportation bid. Uh, current contracts for auditors and insurance plus estimates for inflation. And we level budgeted non-payroll expenses. Uh, debt service payments were updated per the debt service schedules, which actually reduced debt service. Um, U32 had a bond payment that is retiring this year. We made our last payment um, and that was $155,000 a year payment. Uh, the capital fund transfer is uh, where we uh, put that additional 155,000, uh, moved it into that. So now instead of a $725,000 transfer, it's at 880,000. That's for the board to uh, eventually finalize that decision, but that's what I'm recommending. Uh, and then we've got a section that's talking about our update. So in the next, uh, we've got the transportation bid that you just approved. Uh, the leadership team is uh, working on several priorities and um, programs or services that they might bring in the next uh, iteration of the budget. They've, um, we have a meeting on Friday and we want to include any uh, feedback from this meeting. The principals, as Jen had noted, have done a preliminary input from staff in the budget process and have requested uh, feedback from them through a survey. And just to note that the ARP ESSER grant is not fully allocated. Uh, funds are currently obligated for full-time nursing, uh, school counselor staff in all buildings and interventions in FY22 and budgeted in FY23. So you're not seeing in this general fund budget, uh, full-time nursing and counselor staffing at the buildings because it's rounded out in ARP ESSER uh, the same way that it currently is in FY22. So the next steps are for the school board to set budget parameters and priorities regarding any new board goals or initiatives that reflect the community's values. And we're hoping for that feedback tonight. And also for the school board to continue to work to inform and engage the community in the budget process. And in number three on next steps, you'll see the list of things that the, the leadership team is considering while we're reviewing these new program or service requests. Um, and, and it involves quite a bit of things. So the implementation plan, the moving forward plan, systemic state improvement plan, equity enrollment data, resource sharing, community forum feedback, staff engagement, length of student day and community tax burden. Uh, we need to review the special ed student needs, uh, not the specific needs, but the higher level needs. So special educators uh, and, and the requirement across the district a multi-year tech plan and involving cybersecurity and hardening of our cybersecurity needs. The transportation budget updates will be done and uh, operation of plant non-payroll expenses are being reviewed for potential uh, changes or updates. And a multi-year equipment replacement schedule and possibly requesting reserve fund transfers um, to fund that over time. So a multi-year plan on that, uh, as well as the food trip, food service transfer that happens, community connections transfers, and then the revenue and tax updates from the AOE are usually received in December, uh, along with the special education block grant, which is not to be done in a, a re reimbursement fashion due to Act 173. So it'll be one block grant, no matter what our expenses are next year. That's it. I've also included an update to the timeline and really the only change is that I added two leadership team meetings in November, uh, partially because I wanted you all to be aware that we are, how often we're meeting and discussing topics, um, discussing the budget, but also for next year so that we document how frequently we needed to meet and, and we get it ahead of time, so. Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, Jen. It, does the board have any questions? That we'll move into parameters after this, but do they have any questions or input for them? For the next steps, uh, Diane. 
Do we have any ballpark idea of the impact of Act 173 on the funding? I just know in other schools that I'm in, it's a huge impact and is critically impacting budgets. And so um, kind of limits your parameters then. So I just wonder if we have any ballpark idea of what that impact might, might be. So we did receive a preliminary calculator from the AOE um, last week and I ran the numbers and they do, I have some questions for the AOE. Um, they're taking our uh, reimbursement over the last two years and averaging it and increasing it with an inflator of 4.89%. Uh, and that's how they're coming up with our numbers. So theoretically it should be more than last year's uh, reimbursement it, it's slightly higher than last year's, but that doesn't identify what our student needs are. So if we've had additional students come into the district with higher needs or just more identification of students with higher needs um, and, and also students not, uh, you know, if they're higher needs students, but not quite hitting that uh, extraordinary cost level. So yes, I would say it's possibly a very negative number. Um, yeah, I don't have it in front of me and I'm sorry, I should have brought that with me. I did calculate it earlier today, but I will have it for you. Thank you, Suzanne. Hey, Maggie? Um, for those of us who are new to the board, can you just briefly outline how this changes funding? Is it going from a per student accepting Medicaid reimbursement? like? So um, Medicaid is not part of this equation. Okay. Um, currently, we submit uh, basically quarterly reports to the state that say these are our expenses. And um, if students hit $60,000, the state reimburses anything over $60,000 at 95%. The state reimburses us 100% for any state place students. And then anything after that, they reimburse at 56%. Instead of that reimbursement model, the state is moving to basically a block grant model for everything other than state placed, which is remaining the same, and um, the extraordinary cost, which is over $60,000. So those two are remaining the same, but that 56% on any actual expenditures, that, that's not happening anymore. That's where they're taking last year's and the year before, averaging it getting an inflator. <clears throat> so it's really just, here's a grant amount basically. Um, and it just doesn't reflect exactly what we're, we're doing. It does open up a lot of opportunities to the way that we're looking at how we utilize that money though. Uh, I think in the first year is when we're gonna experience this uh, kind of bumpy road of adjustment. But I think it opens a lot of doors for us that that we're discovering. And I don't know if Jen or Carol wants to speak to that a little bit. Um, I would say that, you know, essentially the drivers for Act 173, in addition to price are, uh, or cost, are really offering a, um, a more flexible education system for all students. So all that work that we're doing around coordinating curriculum, multi-layered systems of support, uh, assessment planning, all of those things are part of it. And I think as Suzanne said, financially, it'll be a bit of an adjustment period for us. Um, we are all working hard now to get smarter about it, not only because of the impact on um, special ed services and the provision of services, but because really it's designed to impact the way that we are supporting students across the system from good first instruction to progressive layers of support. I don't know, Kara, if there's anything you wanted to add to that or, or not. Sure, I would add um, the gist of the laws to move us more towards a response to intervention model. And so the biggest transition will be the, the most kind of practical manifestation of the changes will be in special education eligibility. <laughs> so there'll be practices, there's the practical components and then the funding components and the practical components like Jen is saying will relate more to tier one intervention and supports provided throughout tier one and tier two 
as opposed to <clears throat> the strategies in place and the interventions in place for students on IEP. So it's more um, an early intervention, <clears throat> excuse me, model. So those practices eventually will impact um, special ed. And so the funding and the practices are meant to align and uh, change is hard. So there'll be uh, some transition years before it feels a little bit more smooth. Thank you, Kara. Oh, Diane, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so the, the other thing too that this, um, you know, thanks to Dorothy and Scott as well is uh, this is really, or it's uh, intended to be connected to the waiting study. And so kind of part of it, you know, some of the wheels came off. And so I think it's critical for us as a board to really understand that connection and how can one part move forward without another part uh, because it, it will be dramatic. I mean, when we think of the cost of our paras, when we think of the other costs that are currently there, that shift is gonna be pretty dramatic and is potentially at a time when we feel flush with ESSER money in reality because of some of these other financial changes, we're gonna be potentially looking at some heavy duty increases. And so we need to understand all the tools in our toolbox in order to be making um, decisions that are the best for our learners. Yeah. Maggie, you have another question. I just want to say that some of those questions will be addressed in the training that Suzanne is hoping to give to the to the board. Yeah. Mm, let me see. I'm going to let Ursula go first, Maggie, since you were last, OK? Uh, Ursula? I had a follow up question on essentially this block funding for the education. And then um, in addition to Act 173, there is a um, special ed law changes coming into effect in July of 2022. And I'm curious, maybe Kara, that's what you were discussing, is how essentially it's going to change the eligibility of kids for IEPs and how that is going to maybe affect this block that we're getting, which has been passed, you know, based on the student needs that we've had that are based on the old rules. So I'm not sure if I heard your question in there and um, correct. Act 173 is the law that will be behind the changes to special education eligibility. Um, I don't know the details that we want to go into right now for the sake of time. Um, in order for students to be eligible, we'll have to indicate that they didn't respond to various interventions, uh, which will shift a little bit. And so I guess my question is how those elig eligibility changes <clears throat> are affecting our budget when, like Suzanne said, this block is based on our past budget, which is based on previous, what are we looking at? And maybe somebody has, are we expecting a large change in what our needs are versus what we're getting for this block grant? Suzanne, do you want to, I have thoughts, so, but maybe you. Well, Ursula, I will say that the expense side of this budget is based upon student need. The revenue side is not firm yet because we didn't have those revenues from the state in time to have them reflected in this version. So um, the revenues really are not firmed up on this. Uh, the needs are there and it's, it's not that we're not identifying needs, we are. And that's what this, the special ed uh, service plan was in October. Um, it's just that the way that the state is funding, their funding model to the, 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 the school district is changing. So the, the revenue that we receive to offset it will be less. We need to uh, make up the difference in our tax funding. Did that answer your question? I think so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Maggie? I was just curious if there are plans for additional planning time for educators to adjust to these changes, because it sounds like we're talking about EST and 504 kids potentially getting different 
resources in addition to IEP kids? Um, is, is there a plan for that to just provide opportunities for more focused planning? Yeah, we're talking about that now as a leadership team and thinking about how to roll out these changes and let folks know while also being sensitive to all the stress that's within the system and challenges that are going on. Um, in terms of supporting students on ESTs and 504s, I want to say that the goal is to provide more supports earlier on. And so um, I just want to make it clear that the, there won't be a lessening of services for those students, uh, just an increase of services ideally earlier um, as students demonstrate gaps in learning. Yeah, so my question was really how, like, are you going to be afforded the time to do the planning to make that shift? Because that's a significant change in approach. Yeah, I presented to the leadership team um, and to our case managers last week about the changes from Act 173. There's not um, full clarity from the agency of ed as of yet. The new rules will be coming out in January or February. And so I'm, I'm tentative to present too much information and then backtrack. And so the case managers are aware of the changes. And of course, the goal is to break down the silos between special education and general ed. And so their request was, can we share this with everyone and start planning? And um, I'm working with the principals to be thoughtful in how we do that. And again, a way that's sensitive to all that people are holding right now. And it allows us to start the next year prepared for these changes. And so I don't have an explicit plan just yet. I was just diving into them in recent weeks um, and we're starting to get our head around it as a team. And we're very aware that we'll start moving on these soon. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Maggie, question. Uh, let's, let's move on uh, to the budget, per, uh, budget parameters on page 125. And just to be clear, there's two types. I was traveling and I was having the hardest time attaching the, the document and the wrong document <laughs> when, when up. Uh, so it was not updated. So the number five it should, should say reinvigorate. This is what the actual document said. Reinvigorate three, it, one of three initiative, existing initiatives, music, outdoor education, or food services. That's what we had heard in the community forum. So that should have been number five. It, number, right now it has the old, what I gave you last year, because I was using the template. I apologize for that. And then on, on number, uh, number six is, is, is right. I had it as number seven, but there's this, uh, a, a last one. So you can write it down there as number seven. And that was the uh, additional funds for hardening in response to cybersecurity was the other thing that we agreed in the finance committee. So I apologize for that, but those are the, I know that it's more than that the usual, but uh, they sort of align with some of the leadership team yeah, two. So we could go one by one and see how board members feel about them, or if we want to move them up this late, however you want to do it. We, we have a little bit of time. So my inclination would be to just go, since you guys were not part of the finance committee, to just go down the list uh, one by one. Is that okay? So we, we talked about, I included the equity definition there. That's a conversation that we do need to have, but all of these parameters are viewed from that equity lens. So the social emotional pillar aligns with the work that we're trying to do. So could I have just like either thumbs up if you agree that that is a strong parameter or that you would like to see? Yeah. Okay. And then for you, you guys that don't have your cameras on, just you know, speak up if you think it's not, okay? Um, and then continue to offer and further develop the multi-layer system of supports to all students across all our schools and professional development for our teachers. Um, yes? Um, okay, Steven, let's see, yes. Um, 
on the threshold under the threshold for for the penalty we know that the penalty is not on for this this year we felt that just for good practice it would be good for us to use an average we spoke to Suzanne and she said that she could come up with an average even though we were not going to have a number but we definitely don't want to be you know knowing that not just at 173 but the possibility of not this year but the following year having the weight study also it will will hit us we we felt that that was prudent to to leave that there are you guys comfortable with that okay i don't hear any notes i see all thumbs up uh, diana i assume that was a thumb up uh, and then bring the net impact of the expenses budget in under three uh, percent we felt that we needed to give a number right away so okay yeah i yes. this is one that I, I just i don't have enough information so i guess i hesitate to say that and then we get this huge influx and so it just makes it impossible for them to present the budget so uh, you know i just i don't have enough information to know what that number is going to be yeah I agree with you. We talked about it. I will invite Kari and Scott to talk about it. I, I didn't know if we should wait until we find get the first budget to give a parameter. I feel like uh, both Suzanne and Jen were comfortable with getting a number. It doesn't mean that they can't bring something above that. It is just that at least one of the options should be there. Is that uh, is that is that okay? It just well so i think you know and again my brain's a little fuzzy but i i think that when we set those parameters we didn't quite have this number locked in yet i think we wanted to see what it looked like at some of the level funding and what that ended up doing to the expense part of the budget and so to me i kind of need to see that first and then if what we put forward is way out of bounds then that sets the conversation and the discussion but i guess and it's just me that's reflecting this i don't feel i have enough information to say that that's a good number to land on or not for an initial i don't know how any other board members feel kari yeah i think the thinking here is to signal what what we think we're going to be comfortable with when it comes time to present this to the community this is our best thinking now I, I, and, I, and we're asking the administration to come with a budget that meets this it doesn't preclude them from from also saying for an extra half percent one percent x amount we can get this additional thing and we're recommending that you consider that but we want to sort of have them sharpen the pencil and do the exercise of de uh, developing a three percent or less budget at this stage Thank you, Kari. Uh, Stephen, and then Maggie. So uh, I'll mirror a, a little bit of what Kari said. I think this is the most important thing we need to do, and we need to clearly communicate a percent um, so that the administrators can then go forward understanding what our intent is. And I think 3% is too high. I think it should be under 2%. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Maggie? I was going to propose the opposite. Why can't we offer a range like three to 5%? Thanks, Maggie. Um, Jonas? Um, I'm comfortable with 3%. Um, that reflects what at least I've seen in previous years um, in terms of what we the, the the threshold that the board has given to the finance team um and i would say that you know with inflationary pressures throughout the economy um we should be we should be prepared for for that um i think i think two percent is is going to be i don't know i i can't say that what steven said was wrong right because last year we came in <laughs> right at a negative number um but as you know i i i'm not my brain is a little fuzzy too, Diane. Um, um, I'm, you know, I'm not in. I'm not looking for austerity, right? I'm not looking for a gold-plated budget either. Three percent is in line with what we've done in the past. 
Thank you, Jonas. Uh, Diane? I, I'll keep it brief. I, you know, I just, I'm not in agreement to having any number there just because I know in the other budgets and the other school systems I'm doing, we're getting blown out of the water because of all of the supply increases in cost, um, the cost of living increase. There's just, this is not a typical year. And again, it looks so strange because we have so much ESSER money, but it can't touch our budget. And so that's the only thing I, I just, I don't know enough to know if that's a fair number or not, but that I'll, I won't talk again, I promise. No, no that's okay. I, I'm actually gonna ask Jonathan and everybody to say something on, on this. If you would like to, but if you're yeah, comfortable. I would just say that we, um, you know, that historically we've, we've come in at least with initial, an initial budget draft somewhere around 3%, um, just as an initial starting point. But the reality is we're not in usual times. So it may turn out that it's not a reasonable place to start, but I don't know that it's really harmful to, to at least start in that place and then see what what a, a draft budget looks like and and what if anything really needs to be adjusted because there probably will be things that need to be adjusted maybe significantly thank you jonathan jill are you comfortable with the three percent yeah okay uh, anybody else that i'm missing ursula are you okay with the three percent mckaylen Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with the 3% um, <clears throat> as a starting point, but I agree. I mean, with um, costs as they are, I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up having to be higher. So I guess it's acknowledgement of that on my part. Thank you. So I think what I'm hearing for this parameter is that we're comfortable with the, with the 3%, but if it needed to be differently, we, we want to see those options in order to best support our students. Does that, does that make sense? We got that? Okay. And I'll make that change here too and send you the clean draft, Susanna and Jen. Um, okay, moving into the next one, it, it would be to you know, this word reinvigorate or boost, uh, we can use a different word, but that's what I had when I was there. It, we heard from community members about the music program, outdoor education, and the food service program with the dream from, you know, farm to table. So, you know, but I, I felt like as a board, we didn't want to say one or the other, let the administrators and the leadership team that best understand the student needs focus on one of those. Uh, to boost one of those what do you guys think about that and this is from the finance committee not just we discussed it at the finance committee are you okay with that yeah. maggie is that a why question just or one? Are you okay yeah why just one what was the rationale but it could be one or three of them, but it's, it's you know, like Suzanne said when she was explaining, you know, our resources are finite, right? So like it would be better if we can narrow it down, we could, you know, it would be better to invest a, a good amount of money in one initiative rather than make three not too good, right? So, but they can come back to us and say, you know what, you know, the, we have the resources or, or this is where we want to spend our money at least we have put them out there we have a better outdoor program really that we that we think so that might be just information i i don't know but that that I was a the follow reasoning. up question to that sure can we utilize the friends of the district to can we go to them with the potential would you be interested in one of these other two to do some footwork. You know, I'm thinking specifically about the farm to table question. Um, you know, can we can we utilize our community partners to investigate funding sources and support for some of these initiatives? It seems like the music thing is really like a fundamental access issue. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, I 
you know, I, I don't want to answer all, all these questions. These are good questions to put forward to, to them. We, we're taking notes and they, they, they will, sorry, I can't speak. It will come back with some answers to those questions. Are, are you guys in support of potentially that being the fifth parameter? I see Scott is midway. Uh, Kari is midway, so. Okay, I'm seeing more thumbs up than non. Jill, I didn't quite get to see how you felt about this. Do you wanna, that I missed it? Can you hear me? And uh, now I can hear you. Can you hear yeah. me, Floor? Yeah, okay. now I can. Sorry, I'm a little, I'm, I'm double muted. Um, so uh, I, I just am not totally following what you're saying, which is why I didn't raise my thumb. I, I just wasn't tracking. Okay, so what we were saying is I, that- I'm not, we, seeing, I'm not reading it in the packet, right? You're talking about something that's not written on the page. Yeah, so what I said before, maybe you missed it, that I, the yeah. number five was wrong in there. And it's the, yeah. we, we yeah. heard from community members, those three, uh, music, outdoor education, and the food program. So we're yep, asking I agree. Our we heard those three things. Yep. Okay. So you're okay with that yep. being one of the parameters that they could pick one of them to focus their attention. And if none of them is what we can afford, they would come back to us too. But at least is, is that I, clear I enough? Uh, so I don't know what it means. Uh, it's the music one that I'm particularly hung up on. Um, I mean, we have, I'm not understanding what we, I, I think we have a we have a problem we need to solve there. So I I don't think that's an option. So I, I guess I'm just confused by what you mean. That's that's all. That's I, I'm okay yeah. with being confused and just going forward. I'm just not following you. Yeah. So so just to be clear, this is not to solve the existing music uh, problem of the hiring the teachers. So you know, like we the the part of recruiting. You know, like what what we agreed on last year was. To have the music, the, the music program to serve all the needs of our students. This these three are to boost. We're hearing that they, that people want more, right? It's to boost. It's not that is a separate issue, and it's not from as you guys know. It's not for, it's a problem in the state. It's not for lack of trying to hire a music teacher. We have been unsuccessful. We have the the the, the entire music department and the orchestra trying to help us to find a teacher too. There's been multiple uh, attempts and and postings. We just it just hasn't been successful. So, but so that is separate. So what this is a so boost. What, what does it mean to put it on the list here? It means that we're going to talk about in, in, somehow expanding the music offerings beyond what they already are. Exactly. That's what you're saying. It That's means. what we heard from the community members. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I saw three sideways, uh, Scott, Kari, and there was somebody else that was sideways. And then there, I think I'm sideways. Okay, so there's four sideways for, for this initiative and uh, everybody Floor, else okay with it? Floor, what no? was the third? It was music, outdoor education, and what? The food service, okay. farm to table. Yeah, or just food service. So it doesn't have to be farm to table, but that's what we keep hearing. So, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, I just want to say I support all three of those things. Thank you, are, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Ursula. So I just wanted to clarify, like we're talking about these pillars as, um essentially guidelines for the leadership team to come up with this like a first draft and come to us and so I think I guess my understanding from reading that was that if some of these things can't be done or like we talked about in this last one they can't do it for the three percent increase they're going to come to us with that information because it's a draft right correct okay correct correct okay Maggie You're muted or is an old hand? I think Ursula's question answered my question. Okay. So all three, just to clarify, all three are going to be addressed, but then administration would be selecting of the three 
the one that they felt was the ultimate priority or more viable yeah okay yeah. but there's going to be a response to the community on all three points all three areas of focus for example callus and other communities have four wins nature education um, some schools already have volunteer situations where community members are providing maple syrup, for example. Like, is it is there an, is that education about what's actually happening going to be provided to the school communities who are raising these questions because they may not have those answers? So we're we're taking notes as we go, Maggie, and we'll have some responses for for that. Is Suzanne? Do you wanted to clarify something? I saw your hand up. <laughs> I did. I was imagining that what you're suggesting is that we bring you a 3% budget with uh, what we as a leadership team prioritize and then also provide you some a la carte costs for these other priorities that you're providing so that you know how those would impact the budget. That's what I'm interpreting this direction to be. So yeah, yeah, especially for this parameter. Yeah. Okay, so so it sounds like we, we have three no or three so it's not a no so i'm gonna let number five go and move until number six it, develop a contingency plan for expense reduction options in case the rate is not favorable that is just not you know it's just good practice we had it from last year and, and then the last one which really was number six but it didn't get in your packet it was a and i think you guys would all agree it's a hardening and using additional forms for rebuilding a, our response to cybersecurity. Um, okay okay so uh, so we have seven parameters that, and we can move on into the policy committee and hopefully be done by 8.30 is my goal. But <laughs> any other discussion? Flair. Yeah, any other, Jen, yes. Fleur, we have some training to do. Oh, oh sorry, well. sorry, 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 Jen, I'm like, <laughs> yes, yes, that, that was gonna respond to the, I'm so excited about that. Okay, Suzanne, I don't wanna steal your thunder because this is really good and then we'll answer some questions. I hope it's really good. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. It's eight o'clock at night, and this is some some deep stuff. <laughs> um, all right. So annually, the district uh, has done this budget training for school board members, and it's a refresher for veterans, but is especially helpful for new board members. The outline of the training is on page one one twenty seven of the board packet. And I'll just begin uh, tonight by briefly explaining expenditures and revenues. So expenditures are all the dollars a school district plans to spend, the budget plus any deficit or obligation to a regional uh, tech center school district. So what you'll receive in your expense, expense budget, uh, it will be delineated by program or service, such as instructional services, preschool programs, guidance services. You'll see each of those programs or services segmented out so you can see which, uh, how much each of them costs. And you'll see it uh, current year and you'll see a projected column for where we believe the current year will end uh, based on actual, what has actually occurred. And then also the column for uh, FY23 budget proposal. Uh, within each program or service, you'll find specific lines for things like salaries, benefits, tuition reimbursement, all the way down to dues and fees and interest expenses. So you'll see each of those uh, lines separated out that way. The local revenues are money the school district already has or is owed. Federal dollars, state aid for special education, transportation, small schools, tuition, surplus, interest bearing accounts, private donations, et cetera. Revenues currently appear at the top of the budget report and include lines for things like tuition from other school districts, interest earnings, miscellaneous income, such as the tech ed and transportation reimbursements, special ed revenues, and any use of fund balance has to be identified as an actual revenue. The education spending is the amount that needs to be raised 
by education property taxes. These funds are received from the state of Vermont and are the net of budget expenses, less budget revenues. So if you were in a private sector, you'd probably see this as your, uh, well, I mean, in the private sector, it's normally a net income, <laughs> but this is where we're actually looking for income to fund our services. So education spending is currently listed in the revenue section at the top of the budget report. And then it's actually uh, divvied out and uh, figured up and taxed based on an, a per equalized pupil amount. And that's what actually determines the education homestead tax rate. So before I walk you through the tax rate, are there any questions about expenses and revenues? Suzanne, I'm wondering if you wanna share your screen because especially for new board members so they can see or, or we can share it for you and you can keep talking just to... Uh, or if everybody's I following, just, I was fine. just reading what I'd prepared for notes. Okay. So I don't have um, in the packet. Um, I would be looking at the, the, the budget spreadsheets that look like this. Well, that doesn't, yeah. no, I can look it up what pages it is. I think That's 128. Okay. Would, the, would it be helpful if I share that for board members or you're following just like that? Pretty clear in the spot. packet. Okay. Okay. Are there any questions about expenses and revenues? No? Okay. Um, so the next piece, I, I am referring to page 128. And it I'm going to walk you through the tax rate calculation, which is really, really uh, detailed. The state of Vermont is a very complicated tax funding system. Uh, using the budget year 21-22, if we look at page 128 in your packet, it begins with the total budgeted expenditures at the top. And then it subtracts out offsetting revenues. And this calculation gives us the local education spending amount. Uh, equalized pupils are not a straight head count of students. So if you see equalized pupils, it doesn't mean that we have that amount of students in our buildings. This number is actually based upon ADM, which is um, with ADM with an applied weighting. And ADM is the two year average daily membership reported by the district. State place students uses prior year actual numbers. Pupils are adjusted based on the following weighting. Limited Engl English proficiency increases the count by 20%. Poverty adds 25%. Preschool students are actually reduced by 46%. Secondary students, which are identified as grades seven through 12, increase it by 13%. A statewide adjustment is then applied Last year, this, this adjustment was 95.112% and a hold harmless provision, no more than three three and a half percent reduction in one year. So um, all of that waiting. And then at the very end, uh, the state says, you can't have a dip uh, more than three and a half percent. So if, if we were to see a dip in our uh, equalized pupils that went down to 5%, for instance, they would only make us, um, have it at 3.5%. 3, 3 so equalized pupils, any questions on that before I move on to the next piece of it? Just, just to be clear, it is the waiting for equalized pupils that Scott is doing all of his yeoman's work about. Yes. And changes to that system. Okay, I will go on to the next segment. Uh, so the state sets a base tax rate uh, and that comes out from the tax commissioner uh, around or on, they, they usually say on December 1st, but it comes out on or around December 1st. Um, the state tax rate for residential home was a dollar last year and non-residential 1.612. 
Uh, the property yield is set annually by the legislature and is used to determine the equalized tax rate. In FY22, for every $11,317 a district spends per equalized pupil, its equalized homestead tax rate will be $1. And the property yield helps to minimize the impact of big swings in the CLA. The equalized homestead tax rate is the rate a district would have if all properties were assessed at fair market value. So we're seeing the, uh, a couple of different things happen here. We're, we're seeing a count on pupils. We're seeing that count weighted. Then we're seeing the state setting a base tax rate that then gets adjusted uh, by the property yield. And then we're also seeing this impact from CLA. And the common level of appraisal is the ratio of each town's listed values versus the state's listed value. The state's listed value is comprised of actual sales, generally averaged over three years. The state's fair market value is the equalized education grand list. We received this in mid to late December. The actual homestead tax rate is education tax rate seen on a property tax bill of a residential homeowner. Uh, the last piece of it is the excess spending threshold which is an amount set by the state uh, annually to encourage districts to keep spending under a certain amount per student. Districts are charged double the tax for every $1 above the state per pupil threshold. Last year, this amount was $18,789. The excess spending threshold calculation has been suspended for FY22 and FY23. Uh, any questions? Do I need to? Maggie, I'm seeing your hand. Yeah. Is as a new board member, is this where we ended up with reduction in our music last year? Was it was that a budget correction to avoid this? I wasn't here last year, so I'd uh, invite no, someone. No, floor shaking her head. No. Okay. No, it, it was not a budget correction, Maggie. The the, the music that was a, a plan thing. There, it's it, it was based on student needs. It was not on a budget reduction. No, it was not an uh, any number. It was on student. How does how does the board participate in responding to a potential excess spending? How do we interact with that with with you in in so what I heard tonight was um, make an attempt to stay under uh, an anticipated threshold if there were a threshold. So given that the last threshold was, uh, or last year the legislature uh, waived the threshold after the budget process. And so there was an amount that people were trying to stay under, which was that 18,789. So um, I'm anticipating developing a new number um, to try to stay under. And so it's through the board guidance that we would work on staying under that number. That would have been so helpful to know before we had our last discussion <laughs> as a new board member. I don't see any other questions, Suzanne. Feel free to shoot me an email at any time and ask me a question if I haven't addressed. I know this is a really complex uh, process that the state has for us. And if you've got, if you walk away going, I still don't get that, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm, I'm happy to address your questions. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you for giving us that training and it's really helpful. I'm gonna move us into policy. Chris couldn't join us tonight. The policy committee members that are that are here, he sent me an email saying that, that Scott was gonna take over policy for, for him tonight. And I would like to ask you, Lindy, if you wouldn't mind co-hosting this segment with me. Um, thank you. Um, 
Do you want to, uh, because you did most of the research on this D7, would you like to lead off with that one? Sure. I, actually, this was a uh, recommended one. I mean, a required one. And so it's from a model policy. And I think the only change was actually your suggestion, Scott, the word federal <laughs> um, in red um, because of the IDEA Act. And this is definitely required under the um, state. And then the VSBA creates a model one. And I was trying to figure out, oh, I see it was just a typo under the legal reference that was changed. So they're just two minor little changes there of adding the word federal in the second paragraph instead of just of the Individuals with Disabilities Act and then fixing that typo under the legal reference. Um, so yeah, I and, and I should also point out that you, um, oh, you figured out the manual. what's going on with the manual, <laughs> yeah. I just, I realized now as I was focusing on it, because it wasn't in red, at the last, it says the manual can be found on the Vermont Agency of Education's website. Scott couldn't find it. We were Googling. I emailed a friend at AOE who then emailed somebody else. It doesn't, it hasn't been approved through legal yet. So they put out this policy but that manual, we were hoping to have a link or something to make it easier for people to find because the AOE website is not always easy to navigate. But what we learned is the manual has been written, but it has not been approved through all their legal channels yet to publish. And as soon as it is, it will be on the AOE website. Great. Um, and and this, this is a first reading, correct, Lindy? Correct. So there, there's no need to vote, but um, Chris will be cross with us if we don't collect comments or um, changes that you'd like to see, uh, unless you're okay with it. Anybody have anything that they want to um, comment on or, or note for um, the next round in the policy committee when we look at this? Jonathan. Yeah, I would just add that we not include that last sentence uh, only because it's, as it's written, not correct at the moment. That's all. Yeah, I think, Jonathan, when we go to second reading, at that point, maybe we'll know if the manual exists. But what we did find was it would be difficult to put a link in here because the links change too often. So we were trying to figure out how to make it easy for families and decided perhaps we could put, I think the manual will be a PDF on the either district website under special services or have it available that way. So um, we can take that note to the policy meeting as to whether that line stays in and maybe at that point we'll know if it even exists yet or has been approved. Sound good, Jonathan? Okay. Um, Ursula and then Diane. Lindy, did your um, contact at the AOE have a timeline for when that manual will be published? Well, it's at the final stage as far as being with the legal department. And that was, it was about a two line email back from the director of special services, I think that said um, we are, it has been approved by the committee who wrote it all, but it's now just being proofed by legal to make sure that it, so no. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, but I have been told that this has to be done by the end of um, 2021, which means it should be ready to be published January 1st. Thanks, Diane. So that's what my question connects to, because I know that a lot of districts are having to go through this because the state is requiring it now um, due to auditing. Do we know if this policy meets what's required? Okay, I see you nodding, Thor. Okay. Uh, yeah, I this was when 
th this one was one that came recommended to us and it was highlighted by the DSBA in one of our notes. So, so, so yeah, the, the answer is yes, we, everybody's been like trying to hurry up to bring it up. Sure. Great. Um, I have noted Jonathan's comment um, with Lindy's uh, comment on Jonathan's comment. Um, so we can move on, if you like, to second readings of uh, upcoming policies. Um, B8, the uh, electronic communication between employees and students. This is a uh, second can reading. Can I just update, Scott? I'm sorry, Please. I went back to yeah. my email about that timeline question and I was wrong. What I got back from Jackie was it will be available this month. We are delayed as it is still with general counsel. So that is a timeline. So it was instead of the end of December, to me, since she sent this in November, the beginning of November, I'll check again um, before our next policy meeting. That's great. Thanks. Um, so uh, electronic communication between employees and students. B8. Um, first of all, uh, what we could do is move the um, move the second readings as a slate. Uh, would you like to have that? Would you like to consider them as a slate? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, I think Floor would probably. Yeah. So could I have a motion for moving B8, uh, D3, and E46? I move to approve the second readings of policies B8, D3, and E46. Thank you, Jonas. I see Michelle has a clarifying something, Michelle. We oh, can't yeah. do this. So it's second reading and adoption. Yes. Okay. I just want yeah. to make sure that it's more, it, that that's what the okay. motion is. Okay, good, good call. I'm, yes. Yes, yes, I so will move to, to approve the second reading and adopt policies B8, D3, and E46. Thank you, Michelle. And a second? Second. Ma oh, thank you. Is it, Maggie, is that a second or a question? It's a question. Okay, so hold on a minute. We're we'll select seconds. Okay, any discussion? And Maggie, I see you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, so is, is B8 not the policy proposal that we heard public comment from an an educator on, or is that something different? The one that we, I believe the one you're referring to was uh, usage of electronic devices, not communication between. And okay. it was a homemade one where this is a required one from the VSBA. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Michaela? Oh, um, sorry. I I think I had the same. I I thought that the teacher who spoke earlier was talking about one of these. So I just wanted. I agree with it, but um, just wanted to acknowledge. Um, I don't know that maybe looking at how we communicate these ahead of time. <laughs> Thank you, Ursula. So my comment is in line with the fact that we heard a teacher come and comment on a tech related, which I think is either B8 or D3. Um, and their question had been whether or not there could be essentially staff, I don't know, the ability to preview, but staff input on these sorts of policies that affect them on the ground and their ability to do their job. And I guess my question is, is was there staff input in the creation of the policies or did anybody get to see it? Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. Correct, Lindy? Tyler, mm -hmm. um, Tyler Smith was there. Um, yeah. And yeah, please. And aren't I right, Scott, that these are not that policy? There was a I, policy that was written by the tech director previously that had to do with using your personal devices and it was not vetted through VSBA or through the legal. These are both required through VSBA 
for boards and schools. Correct. So the, that that mystery policy is um, is in the package, I believe, on page one thirty nine. But it was not move. It's not part of the motion, as okay. I um, as I heard the motion. Correct. Um, okay. And uh, and yeah, uh, the policy committee is open um, to uh, to. Uh, I mean, there, there are uh, administrator, there's administrator, staff, teacher representation. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what to say. It, it, maybe the communications could be better within, um, among the teachers. I, I don't know. Um, but it also sounds like these two policies aren't really taking anything from that policy that seemed to have bothered the administrator or the the teacher that that that's talked. that's my understanding yeah. yeah um and and uh jen and then diane yeah i think that last spring there were a number of technology policies that were above and beyond what was uh required by the vsba there were a number of concerns about those particular policies the policy committee went back um, now in, the, in this fall and sort of re-examined all of those with sort of new eyes and a lens toward the SBA policies and thinking about what other things do we do that would be procedure and not policy. And so what's being recommended now are the two required VSBA policies, which I think assuages the questions and concerns that had arisen from the staff many months ago. Mm -hmm. And the procedure question, the staff and students already sign a form about how they use, and it's part of a procedure, an internet procedure versus a policy. So those, I, I see that D question mark one is in here, but it's not one we're voting on. Right. Thank you, Lindy. It, Diane? I'm just confused because they're both B8. Are they different? I was confused by that too. I think there's just two copies and that's what okay. I've just been no. going through to figure out why. One of them is a red line version. Yes. I believe that's the way we get them. We get the Thank old you. version and then the one Thank with the changes you. in red. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. And I requested that. So I should have realized. So. <laughs> well, I wasn't yeah. finding the red line because as I was scrolling this packet so big, it kept jumping to different places, but I did just find the red line part on page 135. Yeah. So we have this late. We have a motion by Jonas, a second by Ursula. All those in favor of approving the second reading and adoption of these three policies, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you all. Okay, so now let's move into the consent agenda on, unless there's some final statement from the pol policy committee or any other questions for the policy committee. Just just to be clear, that D question mark that we have just discussed quite a bit, that is still tabled policy is the policy committee and everyone who is attending the policy committee, including stakeholders outside of the committee and the board. Um, there will be another update about that later and we are taking no action on it. Correct. It's tabled. Great. Uh, um, Just related to going way back to the beginning of the meeting, um, I tried to look for a, our gender policy and I don't see it on the website. Um, do we have one? <laughs> and, and is it on the, I mean, and if not, but uh, can, that's my question. Do we have what, one, can, a gender policy? Can you? Can you reframe your question as far as what, what do you mean by a gender policy, I guess? Um, you know, going back to the whatever you call it legal thing we signed on to in support of transgender rights. I don't see a gender policy on our list of policies. I did when I googled it, I saw one in an agenda from a while back. I'm just are all the agenda, all, all our policies are on the website. So if it's not there, we don't have one effectively. 
Correct. Yeah. And I think our practices have been to be an inclusive community and we haven't relied on policy for that, but I will, we, we can take a look into, in, into, into that. Cause I do remember in the past as a unified district, we did pass something. I'm looking at Kari and some other, uh, uh, we did had a, a vote. Well, it, it's late. Ready, but but we'll, we'll look. I yeah, would just I, put it on the put it on okay. the list for a future sure. policy thing, and maybe an environmental policy too down the line when less life is less crazy. I'd be interested. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I did find on the VSB website, VSBA website, there is a C28, which is a transgender and gender non-conforming students, which is under review. Um, and that was from March of 2020. So um, if we have one, it wouldn't be a VSBA one if theirs is still under review. So uh, yeah, we'll yeah. bring it up at our policy to see. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Yeah, and those are under review for six months. So we could potentially have something and they're being looked at under an equity lens now by a by uh, people that are not just the VSBA, but uh, two grants that we had. So it might be worth waiting to see what they come up with. Um, let's move into the policy committee. Uh, sorry, the policy committee. The so in the consent agenda, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of 10, 2021, 10, 30, 21, 11, 3, 21? I move to approve the minutes of October 20, October 30 and uh, November 3rd, 2001. Thank you, Jonas. I'll second it. Uh, thank you, Lindy. Lindy. Yeah. Any discussion? Always thank you to Lisa for the minutes. Go look at other districts' minutes and then compare them to what Lisa gives us. Thank you. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any any opposed? Any abstain? Hearing none, the motion carries. The minutes are approved. Okay, Lindy, you're on the spot. Approve board orders. All right. I make a motion to approve the board order in the total amount of nine hundred nineteen thousand thousand three hundred ten dollars seventy-five cents. Second. Thank you, Lindy. Thank you, Scott. Any discussion? I, you will get an email right after this meeting. Don't forget to send your <laughs> electronic signature. <laughs> okay. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you very much. Okay. Personnel. Page 156, if somebody wants to take the thunder out of Lindy, otherwise I'm counting on you. <laughs> Just scroll down to it, so I'll take the thunder. Um, okay. I make a There's motion just... to accept the new teacher nomination for Lauren Kiesling, I'm sorry mm -hmm. if I said it wrong, as school psychologist. Second. Okay. Thank you, Lindy, thank you, Scott. Any questions? discussion or comments? I don't see any of those in favor of approving the hire of the new teacher, school psychologist, Lauren Kinsley, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Thank you. And I believe that's the only one we have there, right, Lindy? Yeah. Oh, maybe not. Jen. Oh. That is the only one we have, but if you want me to start to embed a, a report around vacancies, I could do that in this particular section. So yeah. I'm going to do my best right now because I don't have it in front of me. I'll be prepared with it in front of me next time. And I'm going to ask the leadership team crew who's here, if I'm forgetting something, pipe in here. Um, we've got still the music vacancy at Callis and at Berlin. And I was texted this evening that um, we hope to bring a nom form to you for the next board meeting. So yes. that's moving forward. Yay. 
Um, we have partially filled the lit interventionist position at Calis, but it, it's not fully filled, but we're grateful for it to be partially filled. We still have a special ed vacancy at Berlin. At Berlin, It's being filled right now, but that created the instructional coaching vacancy. So we'd still love to get a Berlin special educator so that we could have an instructional coach. We still have the driver's ed vacancy, which we discussed many months ago together. Um, and then we have positions in, um, we still have unfilled paraeducator positions. We have some custodial positions and we have some food service. And I can't give you the exact numbers right this second. And I'm just wondering, principals, Kara, Michelle, Mark, am I forgetting anybody right now? That was off the top of my head. No, that's everybody. Okay. So that's where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jen. That was really helpful. And we'll remember to embed that there for the next meeting. Um, future agenda items. There's never a lack of future agenda uh, items. There, there were a couple of, uh, uh, of requests that I might be forgetting right now. There was one, uh, yeah, for the finance, uh, uh, Jonas had brought up, uh, I'm trying to remember right now, uh, and Carrie, you had reminded me, is uh, staff bonuses. Uh, is that, yep, yeah, that, so, We'll be looking at that at our um, finance uh, committee, but I'll also remember for it to uh, to be to be here. Any other? I think with the budget, we have a lot going on right now, so it, nothing. You know, I don't, I don't really want to add anything else. It, I'm sure some other things are going to come up between superintendent evaluation and superintendent search and the budget. I think that. I, I want to be mindful of the support that we can get at central office. Uh, Maggie? Um, just reviewing the last board meeting, I had offered to send a document, share a document with some other approaches that might be utilized to reach people about the community forum. And I did send that to you and Jen and Kari, but I never received yeah. a response. So I'm just looking to clarify whether you received that or not. Yes, yeah, we did receive we, we did receive that and we'll get back to you. We yes, we did receive that. I apologize, Mike, but we'll bring that up at our next uh, meeting and we'll connect with you before our next forum. And in the interim, are we you know, we're free to share that information through existing approaches. For example, Callis has a parent Facebook group. Um, I can share that the link and be proactive in communicating with community members in my town to notify them about the forum rather than waiting until the day before, right? Yeah, yeah, but I, I thought that what we had agreed is that you, you know, we would all help. So if you have an initiative, so after the meeting, we, you know, you and Kari drafted that last one a update. So, so we would, we would do that at the last forum, uh, we put it on the Friends of Washington Central and they advertise uh, for us. But but yeah, you if you want to write something for, for your community, that's that's okay. But if you want to help us for all, you could write something that any of the steering committee could post to to remind people of the forum too. So is that clear? Or no. we can talk <laughs> off the well we can, yeah, we can talk off the I was trying to be proactive. Um and yeah. I think we need more, you know, we had a better turnout last time, but, you know, still hearing directly from community members. And um, I think that the community forum is a great avenue for them to be heard rather than contacting me directly. Um, and I think okay. we, I just think we need to be more proactive about reaching out. And, I totally agree. And there are a lot of different avenues and yeah, so I, I never received a response to that sharing. Um, I wasn't speaking about the content I'm talking about how we're re how we're reaching out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But you did get it, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. we did get it. Yes, we did get it. And anything else otherwise board reflections besides what Maggie just shared? Ursula? I just wanted to say it was really helpful to have the red line 
um, additions of the policies in the packet. And I wanted to say thank you to Diane for asking for it so we could have it. It helped me when I was preparing for tonight. Thanks, Ursula. Anything else? Okay, so one last question. Uh, Kari and Maggie, would you guys be willing to write an update of the and share it with the steering committee to be sent out? Uh, yes. <clears throat> okay. Look, can I just run through what I think should be in there and then people can add to it? Yeah. Um, we joined an amicus brief in support of transgender student rights. We met with our consultant, Mike DeWeese, who's supporting our search for a new superintendent, um, update on our situation with COVID and preventative measures. We reviewed the first draft of the budget for the 22-23 school year and established board priorities for future drafts. And we are planning for our next community forum on December 1st, which will be focused on our budget planning. Anything that you would like to add to that? Enough. No, it's good. Thank student, you. is the student update in there too? Student update, okay. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll draft it. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Any, so I'm gonna move on into public comments for all the brave that stayed on. Please raise your hand or speak up. I don't see any hands up. Okay, I don't see any other community members with us. So thank you for the ones that stayed. I see that Lisa stayed with us. So thank you for braving up. And so we're ready to adjourn unless if I could have a motion to adjourn. I'm going to adjourn. That we adjourn. <laughs> ah. <laughs> okay, uh, Lindy and Jonas. Lindy moves, Jonas second. All of those in favor of adjourning the meeting, please say aye and leave. Aye. 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 Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Happy yeah. Thanksgiving to everybody. <laughs>